Hey everybody, thanks so much for being here. Um, uh, my name is Sean Weiner, I uh, work at a place called the Jacob Burns Film Center and I run their Filmmaker Fellowship and Residency program over there and I work with filmmakers as they kind of hone their creative voices. Um, but today I'm, I'm really in a position of being a ultimate fan, which I imagine so many of you are as well in the audience and, uh, and really relishing the opportunity to hang out with Dean. Um, if he'll allow me to say a bunch of really nice things about him just to start off and then we'll get to talking. <laughs> um, uh, as many of you know, Dean has collaborated with legendary filmmakers like Robert Zemeckis, Ron Howard, Steven Spielberg, John Carpenter. Um, he was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Cinematography for Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which we will talk about at length today, um, and also uh, recently received the ASC uh, Lifetime Achievement Award in 2014. Um, the list uh, which uh, my predecessor started going through is s something quite incredible and almost just seems like a list of some of the just most me memorable films of our lifetime. But uh, just for the sake of talking about a few of them, um, Dean has visualized such incredible films as Halloween, Escape from New York, The Thing, Back to the Future Parts 1, 2, and 3, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Hook, Jurassic Park, Apollo 13. I mean, we're talking about some of the most significant films. Um, and films that we uh, have seen, our families have seen, films that are just uh, uh, within the kind of collective consciousness of, of people who love cinema. Um, and uh, one point that I'll be harping on, but I think Dean will allow me to talk about with him as well, is that over the course of our lifetimes, film has made these incredible um, technological advancements where there's opportunities to develop new language for storytelling, whether that's uh, CGI, whether that's incorporating animation into live action. Um, and it just seems like in your history of telling stories visually that every time one of those new things was invented, uh, they went straight to Dean and said, well, let's try to figure out what that language is. And every single time those films become these touchstones that when you go back to them, I mean, if you go back to Jurassic Park or if you go back to Who Framed Roger Rabbit, it's, they're still the best versions of that. You know, and uh, and people have learned from that, and people learn techniques there, and so we're just so thrilled to have you here. And it's thus ends my monologue. But welcome. Well, thank you. <coughs> thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. Great pleasure to share. Um, the only thing is, they didn't tell me it was going to be this cold. <laughs> but we'll get through that. Real LA guy over here. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, this is this is such a great um, great privilege for me to be able to share. Um, and what I'm I'm hoping to do, I mean, it's easy to to talk about cinematography and um, you know talk about the technology, talk about how I put an 18K through a window to do this lighting. But what I'd really like to talk about is the thought process that goes behind uh, that, that is part of the visual storytelling as opposed to the visual painting or whatever. Um, so the, the clips that um, we will see, um, each, each one I, I picked them because they, they show a particular aspect of um, decision making, um, you know, how do you uh, tell the audience, but involve the audience emotionally? Um, and I've, I've been able to work with some of the very best visual storytelling directors. You know, I mean, it, they don't get much better than Spielberg. He has invented an awful lot of shots and techniques that, that we use all the time. So, um, you know, when you, when you go to school, in the Spielberg School of Filmmaking, um, naturally some of it rubs off. But also, um, you know, I've been very fortunate to be able to contribute to um, the the visual storytelling of, of these guys. You know, it's um, it's fun to be able to take a, a uh, Bob Zemeckis idea and then <coughs> expand or make it come to fruition. So. So uh, what I will try to do is um, talk through each clip, pointing out um, 
decisions that were made, techniques that were done, um, you know, and, and I asked them to play the, the uh, sound down quite low. So I hope that doesn't ruin the movie for you. I, I have a feeling that they've seen the movie before, so oh. <laughs> you well, might be in the clear. In that uh. case, it's okay. <laughs> but um, <coughs> no, so I would, um, I will try to, um, you know, describe some of the thought processes um, that we went through as far as how do you tell the story. And, and um, um, just one quick thing. Sure, yeah. Um, <coughs> you know, good, good filmmaking to me, visual filmmaking, is that all you have to do is show the audience exactly what they have to see at any particular second in the film that emotionally involves them. Now, it sounds easy, but um, that's, that's the process that I think one has to go through. I, uh, what about this scene? What in it, what is in the characters? Um, what must the audience experience? Um, and then you find a way to do that interestingly or, um, you know, with, with uh, some kind of style. And we were talking about this a little. Th th this conversation's been going on for an extra hour upstairs in the green room, so I apologize that you guys didn't get to experience that part. But one of the things was this sort of carefulness or craft that we see in some of these classic films and how the fundamentals of visual storytelling, where you place the camera, how you frame it, why it moves, uh, is so thoughtful and intentional in the films that we'll look at today. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you you know, how you cut your teeth and how, s you know, some, of some of the films that we're not going to look at today are uh, your work with um, uh, John Carpenter. Uh, I, I know you worked a little bit uh, with Corman. Like, you had these places to sort of play and learn. Um, can you talk about how that brought you to the place where you sort of had built out your own language of how to visually tell stories? Yeah, I think um, I grew up in film... Well, I graduated from UCLA Film School in 68. Uh, if any of you have seen um, um, the um, recent uh, Hollywood film of, what's his name? Uh, Quentin something or other? Yeah, yeah, that's the guy. Um, I, I watched that film and said, oh yeah, <laughs> I lived in, in that time. Um, and uh, so I, I came up out of a... Um, a period that was sort of um, interesting but fortunate in that we had drive-in theaters. Um, and, you know, they have been gradually disappearing, turning into shopping malls, whatever. Um, and I had the opportunity to make product for drive-in theaters. So there was this market for low-budget action movies and... and horror films and so forth um, that, um, you know, hadn't existed before when the studios ran all of the distribution. So <coughs> I, uh, I had a chance to sort of experiment and work on these low-budget movies and make mistakes and learn from my mistakes and so forth. And, uh, and then that sort of disappeared, you know. But now the drive-in movies, the drive-in theaters have reappeared except they're in your living room. Um, and, you know, there's this need for content. So the opportunities now for filmmakers are, are I think, increasing. And, and um, y y you know, we, we could make mistakes and nobody would really notice. The audience wasn't concerned. They were most likely in the back seat of the car. <laughs> <coughs> but um, now, you know, you, you really have to be a little more meticulous and careful and creative because um, there is uh, a lot of eyes on the um, the screens. When looking at uh, early work or even looking at things like um, uh, the original Halloween, um, there are techniques that you wound up using. Um, we were talking a little bit about your, the idea of using point of view shots. Um, I know we'll, we'll explore that a bit in the clips, but just sort of how a cinematographer comes across uh, uh, shot types or angles that feel right and might become part of your kind of toolkit of how, how you like to represent the world around you? Well, filmmaking style obviously is always evolving. It, the audience evolves. Um, and, um, you know, so 
I, I think my opportunity to work in these low-budget films gave me a chance to kind of experiment with things and say, oh, that was great, or oh, that sucked, um, you know. And um, so I, I think that um, now, you know, it, w when there was film, every decision you made had to be done in front of the lens. You couldn't see it light would go through the lens and got stuck on this film and that was it. So it made you very thoughtful about, um, you know, your shots, um, the, the camera position, the amount of light, the, is it contrasty, is it, uh, what's it, the color, all of that stuff. And then you went to dailies the next day or two days and you were either surprised or shocked or dismayed or whatever. Um, now, you know, you can run to the monitor and look. And I think it gives a false sense of security. You know, I, I, as I teach filmmakers now, um, the, there's this opportunity to say, oh, look, here's a digital camera. And look, you can see uh, on the monitor, and look, there's plenty of light, so we c let's shoot. Um, <coughs> and uh, I think that this thoughtfulness that we had to go through is, you know, kind of like has the opportunity to disappear if we're not really careful as filmmakers. 